Cindy. So I think we're going to go ahead and start so that we can start on time. And I'm a kind of an on-time person. And in this case, we don't need a quorum to begin our meeting. Um, Stacy, oh, Stacy, and I'm waiting for Jenny. If you'll put your number in front of your um, names, that would be helpful. All right, so we're going to call to order and our opening business is that as authorized by the Utah Code 52-4207, this meeting is being held electronically with an anchor location at the State Board of Education. The public may also attend electronically. So we are going to go on a little bit of a continuation from yesterday, and we're going to go to act. Uh, we're going to go to 5.1. We'll turn the time over to Deputy Superintendent. Um, Deputy Superintendent Scott Jones of Operations, excuse me, Operations. And then Scott, if you will introduce those who are with you. Um, before I give you that, board members, if you'll please put your um, district in front of your name, that will really help when you raise your hands. Okay, Scott, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Belknap. Uh, good afternoon, board members, members of the public, staff. Um, I'm honored to be part of this study session. Uh, end state for this study session is that the board, um, by way of the Budgetary Procedures Act or in accordance with the law, makes proposals to the governor's office for um, your uh, budget for the 2000 uh, for consideration by the governor. Uh, but then ultimately, as we go into the next legislative session for what amounts to uh, fiscal year 2023, um, just a few um talking points or touch points before I introduce the staff and we get right into this. Um, you know, just wanna, you know, again, provide a shout out to all the staff to put all the time and effort into these business cases, the videos and what you see is the um, request for appropriations charts or request for funding charts, RFA charts. Um, yes, uh, you know, we were asked by board leadership superintendency was to prioritize you know, our top 10 cases and we did that. Uh, we feel and recognize though that all of the uh, work that's been done is, is an integral part of this process and it's intended uh, so that you as board members can have all of the di different information, all of the um, proposals put in front of you uh, for decision-making purpose to ultimately get to the end state, which is to go forward with uh, your proposals at your direction um, for, you know, not only the meeting the law or the Budgetary Procedures Act, but for the upcoming legislative session as well. So with that, um, key player, key deliverer today, our starting pitcher, if you will, is uh, Del Frost. Uh, Mr. Frost, you all know and have met before. Uh, Del's put a lot of time, obviously, in support to the staff in this effort and consolidating all of this great information uh, for you all to make a decision on today as far as, again, what goes forward. Uh, so I'll initially turn it over to Dell. However, too, um, should you have any questions, and we do encourage you, ask us all the questions you think you need to know, or, or so we can give you the answers that you need to know to, again, make an informed decision on what should go forward. Um, all of the staff um, is available. Obviously, you know, superintendency is here, uh, but if there's really just, you know, some deeper dive um, portions of these business cases, or the funding or you know, the programs that we're presenting today, uh, we have that support uh, system in place as well, which is all the great experts that um, are optimally focused on resources to the kids and the educators. Um, so with that, um, Chair Belknap, uh, if we could turn it over to Dale, we're gonna start where we left off a little bit and we do wanna spend just some quality time with you on one particular uh, topic, um, I mean, obviously there's a lot here, but we feel this is a really important piece of the study session, which is how does an increase in the value of the WPU affect other programs? Uh, because we think that that's, this is a very important piece here for all of us to, to, to spend a little bit of time on here initially, so that as you're making your determination on what goes forward, considering that you know there are particular business cases or programs that are being put in front of you that should you you know an increase occur to the value of the WPU would also increase that program by virtue of the connection if you will or the interoperability or integration of the WPU value increase 
uh, affecting those programs. So Beth, I think that's really where Dell's going to start with you today. Um, and Recording then we'll in progress. So, um, Chair Belknap, your direction, is it okay to turn it over to Mr. Frost? Yep, just before you do, Scott, and then I'll, I'll go right to Dale. Dale, thank you for all your work on this. I wanted to just publicly thank you for that. And then also, um, just as a reminder, once again, the staff did not prioritize these, like Dale did not pick which ones he thought were number one. The, the business cases were giving, given up to the superintendency and they con collectively um, came up with what they thought were their top 10 priorities. That doesn't mean we have to create top 10. We don't have to create top two. We have discretion. And um, just a personal note, the, the more concise we are with our legislators, um, the more apt we are to get those items that we are, are concise with. So Dell, you can correct me on that if I'm wrong, but you go right ahead, Dell. Thank you. <laughs> Well, Chair, if I could, just right before Dell starts, ma'am, if I could real quick. We're also at the end of, towards the end of Dell's initial presentation here, we do have a, uh, you know, maybe a starting motion or something that, that could start that process to your point of where the board determines uh, what goes forward and if and in what prioritization or not. So, so Dell will wrap his portion up with that. So that we can get the discussion going and moving because we know we, we're under a little bit of a time constraint here, but it'll it'll go well. It will really go well here today. So thank you all. So um Chair. You, Chair. Bill Matt, may I now start? Sorry, Deputy Superintendent Jones. I, I thought you were done there. Um <clears throat> uh, you are correct on the superintendency uh, uh priorities. Uh, the, the staff generally didn't have a vote. I didn't have a vote. Uh, and they collectively decided on those, those 10 just as a starting point and an assistance to, to you all because they're uh, on which, you know, and it's a good starting place, but certainly not trying to say that, that is where the ending place should be at all or anything along those lines. Just um, sidebar, Dale, sorry. And that was at the request of leadership. It wasn't just that they decided to do that. So go ahead. Correct. We wouldn't have done that without the direction of leadership. And it's my understanding that hasn't been done in previous years uh, as far as, you know, uh, so, but I do think it's a, a value add uh, to your process as you consider, because every business case, there is a compelling argument for that funding and there's limited funding. And that's the challenge with this exercise. Uh, so if, if I may uh, chair, we have two general requests for the board for motions, and we need kind of two outcomes. First, we, uh, we will need uh, the board to act to uh, direct staff to transmit these to the governor, these business cases uh, generally. And uh, our, our request is that those that get transmitted, you also adopt the policy that you permit staff to seek legislation on the policy side were those business cases that have a policy section. And I think you briefly reviewed those yesterday. There are about six or seven of them. Um, and, and so one of the questions for board members um, would be that, it, you know, are, are there any um, business cases that should be held before those are transmitted? Um, and then the second is the prioritizations. And, you know, from a staff perspective, we think a good place to start is those top 10. But uh, you can take them out, add others in. And I created uh, kind of a running tally chart um, that I'll show you that looks very much like the, the tracker that you'll see just so that you could kind of see uh, a starting place on that. So just wanted to set the stage there. Those are the two kind of outcomes. If we can get there by the next, in the next two hours, that will be work well uh, done and uh, we'll, we'll be able to move forward on that. Um, any questions on those two pieces? I see Chair Huntsman's hand. Chair Huntsman? Yes, thank you. I'm going to get my hand taken back down. I just have a, a quick question, and I think it might be. Chair, you might want to go off my video. Part. Go off video. But, um, okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll just stay this way. Um, 
on the WPU, so maybe you explained it and my brain was someplace else yesterday, but any increase, uh, there's a question regarding uh, a WPU increase. According to House Bill 357, remember the constitutional amendment and everything, will the WPU automatically this year get that cost of living increase, whatever indexing they're using? Um, so that our, my question is, is if that's automatically put in place, and then we ask for a percentage increase, is that on top of that cost of living? Because, and, and then before you answer, I'll explain to the board, many times when we would ask for a WPU increase, approximately two, two and a half percent, some LEA say 3% of the WPU was just to deal with inflation, steps and lanes, just automatic, cost of doing business increases. So that's that's why I'm bringing the question up just for our own situational awareness. So, so the question goes back to, if we ask for 5% and get 5%, are we getting 5% and that inflation factor that's protected under House Bill 357? That is my question. Thank you. Yeah. Jim, if I can answer that. and. I, that's a great segue into the first thing I wanted to share. Uh, may I share my screen? Um, I, I let's see. This was all right. Let me know when you can see that. These are the it's MSD there, tables. It's okay, there. great. Thank you. So I'm just going to first off. I love seeing your faces, but I need to see the screen. All right. So let me go down here to answer directly Chair Huntsman's question. All right, so this is the tracker as you've seen it, and you saw that I, I uh, kind of colored in certain colors some of the, the business cases and requests. And this is in your backups. I think it's one of the last documents on Civic Clerk. So Chair Huntsman, to answer your question, this WPU value increase for inflation, this $87.5 billion, that's our placeholder amount right now. We're gonna go through the common data uh, common data committee process to actually figure out what this what this real cost is. Um, but our, right now our placeholder is two and a half percent. This is the automatic increase that will happen um, because of House Bill 357. 357. And, and, and so then you see down here, 175 million for the WPU value increase. And this aligns with the JLC priority and, the, and their request and our request as it stands right now is 5%, and that would be on top of the 2.5%. So if both of these were to pass, you would it would be the 175 plus the 87.5, which would be a net 7.5% increase in the WPU value. Does that answer your question, Chair? Yeah, yes, it does. And I can see how the placeholder um, is is there but there's assumptions there of what that value will be but at the same time because it's it's an automatic increase why are we is there an advantage or a disadvantage of having it on this if i may answer that chair um, well but, i just wonder what the advantage or disadvantage of it is if it's right. just gonna if it's fixed so these these three are not really business cases here, and you know we are trying to figure out what do we call this because we're also not considering the USDB business cases. So we decided to call these statutory, uh, you know, programmatic changes. And the the purpose is, be, and what the way I would respond to that, Chair Huntsman, is that this 138 million is even though it's on autopilot, it still impacts the budget. And, and so we kind of want to get, you know, an, an idea of what, what is the spending that will be rolled in new spending that will be rolled into the base budget before you even start the conversations on business cases. And, um, and so that's what I would say. That, but these are not part of your prioritizations because um, there's not a need on that front. But I did include these on this table and the table that, that you'll see that kind of running total. So you can kind of get a sense of total increases because this is kind of new territory 
because of the, the changes to statute and the constitution, where in years past, you had to advocate for this 87 and a half million or this 50 million, in, in, if that makes sense. So Dale, you're, it, you're, you have this on here so that we understand as a board that if there's 450 million available, if there is, because that's kind of been the right 400 to 450, somewhere in there, that that has to come off the top. So, yes. and if I can just follow up real, one, one last time, um, Chair Belknap, yeah. it has the appearance that, that it looks like an ask. Even the JLC said it as a priority. Well, it isn't a priority because we advocated that we're not going to come back to the well and ask for growth uh, and and inflation. So that's my only I'm, I'm not being critical, but as we make our presentation to the as we submit to the governor, I, I, I think right now it looks like we're, we're asking him to obey the law. So that's that's my only comment. So thank you. I'm, I'm sure we can format this different. I just. One I appreciate one understood, but it is it is a law right now. So yeah, Chair Huntsman, I appreciate that, and it's interesting that JLC has that as a priority. Um, Dale, before we go back to you again, uh, Board Member Earl, do you have a question as well? I I do have a question. I am, and the WPU value increase for inflation that is that is a set amount, right? Like it's a it's a percent, two point five or whatever you indicated. Is that accurate? Yeah. So two and a half percent, Chair, if I may, yeah, two and a half percent is a placeholder amount. The actual percentage increase on the WPU value is determined by the, it's a five-year rolling average of the, okay. the CPI September to September. So we won't actually know the last year of that until the end of this month because September just finished and they have to calculate CPI. So it might be 2.2%, it might be two, we, the, the placeholder we're putting okay. right now is 2.5%. Okay, and I, I guess my my question, when we say for inflation, that just, are we literally meaning inflation that's occurring? I mean, is that going to impact that? The inflation that's currently taking place um, around the state of Utah and around our nation? Or is, is this a different mechanism? This is merely assists in, um, do, do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, no, kind of, I, I apologize. Yeah, okay, well, it doesn't have that kind of um, be, because there is inflationary uh, just in general, the cost of things. I'm just wondering if there's a mechanism built into that for that inflationary cost of what's happening in society right now, <laughs> or if it's just simply based on numbers of two percent based on um, the five year average or whatever. Chair, Chair, if I may, um, this is just this is not directly connected to any particular areas of inflation. Um, okay. It is the general the general inflation rate is what's in the law to to direct the legislature to increase WPU by the certain amount. Okay, thank um, and you. then and then school districts can use those funds to address whatever cost that they that they whether it's inflationary or not. That that's up to them. I don't know if that answers the question. It did, Dell. Her hand is down. Okay, it Del, did. Go Thank ahead. you. May I continue, Chair? Please. Okay, great. Um, so let me quickly. I, I think these questions are are excellent because they get to kind of the the root of our funding system. And there's a lot of confusion around what the W. We hear the WPU value a lot, and um, I, I wanted to just give you a very quick overview of what the WPU is and how it factors into the actual budget. Uh, so this is the table that's shown in the appropriations report uh, that comes after, usually in the summertime. Um, and we base a lot of our calculations on these numbers in this table. So you can see here the WPU value for this year is 3,809. You've probably heard that number. Um, what what that really means is you have all of these key programs in the basic school program. So let me use kindergarten, for example. Kindergarten, what the law says is that for every full-time kindergarten student um, who generates a full ADM, and we can get into that if you want, generates 0.55 WPUs, because in this program, we pay for half-day kindergarten, in, a set, in essence. And so what Let's say, you know, so you see there's 26,400 
46 WPUs. Um, there are actually almost uh, 50,000 or so uh, kindergartners, but because it's the 0.55 WPUs, the actual WPUs in this program is the 26,000. So you take the full-time equivalency, essentially, the full ADM, you multiply it by 0.55, and then those are the WPUs. And if you multiply the 26446 times 3809 and round to the nearest hundred, you'll get very, very close to this $100 million. So that's how we get to these amounts. And you can kind of see how it plays out because if you look here, the WPUs in 21 last year were actually higher so that there were more kindergarten students in 21 for whatever, and I think it was because of the drop because of COVID, in kindergarten students, but I'm not 100% sure. It may be the projections here. But you can see that even though the WPUs are greater because the value went up, the actual dollar amount is greater in 22 versus 21. And I'm just showing you the power of the increase in the WPU value. So all of these programs here that get actual WPUs, when you increase the WPU value, you automatically increase the value and funding to that program. Um, and so when you see these green, um, the, the, these green rows right here, basically what that means is all of these will automatically increase with the, the WPU value. And then, so does that make sense? Any questions on the basic school program and how it's structured? I don't see any hands, Dale. Okay. And I do want to show you this, the basic school program is by far the largest program in the state. It's the largest program of the, the K-12 budget. It's, you know, at three point, almost $3.5 billion this year. And so most, the vast majority of that $175 million for the 5% increase to WPU above inflation would be to increase these programs right here. And that's kind of, because I, I want when we say WPU value, there's not a program called the WP value. Um, there are these programs here that, that are driven by the value of the WPU and the, and the number of WPUs. Let me just go through one more example here. You'll see the students at risk add-on here, 13,505 WPUs and $54 million. One of the business cases right here, the number two priority that the superintendency um, put forward is the at-risk WPU add-on. You'll see this $44.2 million. That $44.2 million is actually increasing the number of WPUs and not the value of WPUs. So that's 175 million would actually factor into the at-risk WPU add-on and, and that increase would actually be larger. But because these are each separate requests and you don't it gets really complicated if you try to make one contingent upon the other, we have them separate. But that's kind of what, where I wanted to show you kind of the interplay between those two. Thank you, Dell. We have a question by board member Hart. So we're increasing the number of WPUs, not the weight of the WPU, the, pro, pro, uh, the not the number. weight uh, preschool is point, 0.55, we're increasing so, the weight. So in that one case, if I may, Member Hart, uh, Chair, can I answer? I apologize. Yes, please. Um, so this 13,505 WPUs, that's the current weight that mm -hmm. exists in statute right now. And Tiffany Stanley could give you the specific numbers. I think it's 0 0.05 for economically disadvantaged students, but I'd have to go back and look. And then if that business case were to be moved forward and fully funded, that weight would, I think, double to 0.1. So every student that's economically disadvantaged would be generating twice as many WPUs as they currently are. And then the value of that WPU, if that increases as well, so it's kind of a double increase. Does that make sense? It would, so yeah, the I just... number of WPUs and the value would, would both impact the dollars for that program. So, and maybe this is something you, I mean, feel free to tell me just to take it offline. Why, why don't we just change the weight from the weight? Why, why, why do it that way? Is that just how legislature here does it? 
you know, I, I'd be happy to have like a deeper conversation on this. I don't know all the reasons why this structure is the way it is that the basic school program is structured this way. Most, most states, I will say this, uh, have some sort of WPU value, some kind of value for uh, a full, a full-time student. Mm -hmm. And that factors into many of their basic programs, but the actual weights and the, and the, the, the functions of that can vary dramatically between the states. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I just needed to make that shift. Thanks. Thank you, board member Hart. Board member Earl. I'm just trying to summarize in my mind to make sure I understand what you just said. You said that when the um, when the at risk add on the, an increase in that does a double increase. In other words, it increases not only the amount for the at risk, but it actually produces more for district for their actual WPU as well. <laughs> Dale, I think she's got it just opposite. Is that, but you let, tell me if you, I'm wrong. Let me use, let me use numbers oh, sorry. here. And, and that may help to answer your question, member Earl, but I'm, I'm not- Don't use too many it. numbers, Dale, I, because all these numbers are I can, getting fumbled in You know there. what, I can ask this one later. I, no, it, I think this is important, yeah. Jenny. Okay. I, 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 I do think it's important too. So if you look at 54 million and you saw the business case for the at-risk WPU add-on is 42 million. And again, that, that's a placeholder amount. We have to kind of figure out what that exactly costs also through the CDC process. But take 40 million plus, and I'm just going to use round numbers for everybody, 50 million plus 40 million would be 90 million, correct? And, and, and so that if that business case went forward, you would have 90 million in the students at risk add-on, but then that, and that would be a number of WPUs, let's say 20,000. But then on top of that, the value of those 20,000 WPUs could increase. We know it's gonna increase by at least that two and a half percent or that inflation adjustment. Let's say that overall between the inflation and whatever the total increase in WPU is, is at 5%, let's say. Well, 5% of, of 9 million is about four and a half million. So, so instead of 90 million, you would have 94, 95 million because of those two pieces in their interplay. I don't know if that helps. Okay, so you're not. just saying when we increase the WPU, it creates an automatic increase to the at-risk. The at-risk is just a, an example of the program that I was showing here in the basic school yes. program that we're asking for both WPUs in one business case and increasing okay. the value of the WPU in another business case. And they come okay. together for a total amount. Okay. Dale, for clarity on this, are the, the items on the screen right now, the all, just for clarity, the only items that on the WPU increase are automatically increased or are there, I mean, there may be some other minimal ones, but are these those on the screen? I would say this is 90% of it. Thank you. I'll show you the other 10%. No, I don't need the other 10%. It's fine. I <laughs> <laughs> well, so the last part I wanted to say, but I do think this is important to try to help folks understand conceptually what the WPU is. And I apologize. I'm still trying to figure out how to communicate this to folks. Uh, we're all learning together. Um, that, but, but understand the basic school program it is really a key piece of budgeting because it is the biggest piece. So just understanding that you have the number of WPUs and the value of the WPUs and those th two things together generate the funding for a specific program. And you have to know both of those pieces. So if, if there are no more questions, let me just quickly go to, this is where the point that I was trying to make yesterday about some of these other programs. This is the second piece of the minimum school program I, I, I see a couple of hands raised. Before I move on to that, do we want to have those questions answered? Dale, those are still up. Sure. I don't think, I think, oh, except for oh, that. Okay. So finish, finish what you're saying, then we'll come back. So, so the basic school program is the biggest piece, this green box. And you hear the term above the line and below the line. All that means is above the line is the basic school program. Below the line are the these two other pieces of the minimum uh, school program, the related to basic, which is really a collection of 50 or so, maybe 30, let's see, 
I, I don't even remember last time. It's 30 to, to 40, excuse me, um, different programs all put together that equal about a billion dollars in funding. You can see this right here, $968 million. And then the, the second section is this vote and board local levy program. And these are guarantee programs for school districts. And I'm not gonna get really into the vote and board side of things. So if you see here on this kind of, you know, orangish reddish color here, you'll see this is the expenditures uh, by categorical program. So do you see some of these that say, that, that are highlighted and underlined. I highlight and underline them for you because these are the related to basic programs that also get that automatic increase. Transportation, and it, and it depends on what program it is. So like charter school local replacement doesn't get the WPU value, but they do for enrollment growth. There were two pieces to the automatic increases. If you remember, there's enrollment growth and the WPU value increase for inflation. Enrollment growth, there's also not a program called enrollment growth. This basically means, enrollment growth means we're automatically increasing certain programs within the MSP for general enrollment growth. So if the student population in the entire state grows by 1%, you would multiply transportation, for example, by 1%, and you would add that to that appropriation. And then if the WPU value increases by 2.5%, you would, you would increase it by another two and a half percent. Um, and I think that's important, especially on transportation, because in that case, and the JLC recommendation is to get to the 85% of, of funding, just so you, you know, it's very likely we'll be getting somewhere between, because of those two factors, you know, three to three and a half percent multiplied by 111 million. So we need 5 million, we're gonna get three or 4 million already. Now, um, and, and then if we add the 5 million on top of that, we'd be above the 85%. And so I just wanted you to be aware of kind of how those impacts uh, occur. These other programs that are not highlighted for you, and there are more down here, you'll see all of these. These do not receive um, uh, automatic increases. Um, and there may be a couple programs here or there that I'm not 100, you know, being 100% accurate, and I'll probably be corrected in emails later. But I do wanna show you that's one of the reasons why we have this one business case here for the maintenance of operations. Those programs that were highlighted for you above, they are not receiving an increase because of this business case. The business case is looking at the largest related basic programs and one other one, which is right here, the Regional Education Service Agencies, the recents. Those are the, we're suggesting in that maintenance of operations, if you move that forward for the 4.2 million, these programs would, see, would receive the same kind of treatment as these programs in the related basic, is the basic idea there. And you can kind of see here, here's the assumed growth factors, enrollment growth and the WPU factor. That's kind of how that plays out. I, I hope that makes sense for you all. So that was all that I really wanted to, I, I know that's a little complicated and it gets, into the, the, the realm of budgeting that's kind of confusing, but I, I hope that can help you as you figure out what to prioritize, that there are certain cases. So let me go back to these. So the now, ones that me, are- Let me oh, hold you ahead. just for a minute because Brent Strait had a question, board member Strait. Oh, he's good. good. The more he's he good. talked, the less okay. questions I had. Thank you. We're good. Okay, Dale, go ahead. So do you see transportation here? Do you see how it- I didn't know how to show transportation because I made this in that burnt orange color and this in green. And this is just to say that even though transportation is part of the related basic, it does get the automatic increases. But let's look at, you know, uh, Be Beverly Taylor, for example. So BTS uh, does not get those automatic increases. And so, it, you know, right now the, the appropriation for, for BTS arts is 12.8 million. If uh, no additional appropriation is made to BTS, their appropriation next year is 12.8 million. But if, if costs increase, which they likely will for BTS, that means you can afford fewer instructional provide, uh, specialists in BTS. And so the idea of the maintenance of operations business case, and I think BTS is a great example of that, that's 450,000. Basically that 450,000 would enable BTS to not reduce the number of 
of specialists it can provide. And if we want to expand above that, that's another policy decision, but we're not moving backwards because of inflation or enrollment growth. And so that's the, the general idea of the maintenance of operations business case. So these that are in orange right here are, are parts of the related basic program that would not receive automatic increases unless the maintenance of operations business case were funded. It's kind of the basic idea, but the green ones would. Those are part, those are already kind of on autopilot, if that helps you all. Thank you, Dell. Anyone have questions for Dell or Deputy Superintendent Jones? Okay, so I'm I don't know if I'm going to you, Dell, or to anyone else if we're Scott, if we're going to start looking for motions, or do we I I I want to bring up one other thing, just as a reminder, some of these also have statutory request changes and that we'll want to include if we're going to make those a priority, we'll also want to add to make those statutory changes or requests for those changes as well. Scott? Right. So, yes, ma'am. So, Dale, if you're ready, why don't you pull up that Sorry, proposed uh, one? connecting to the internet. And, and Scott, can I add to something that Chair Belknap said? Uh, so sure. Chair, Chair Belknap, you, you said for the uh, cases that you prioritize, but it would be not only the cases you prioritize, but any that you transmit. We would want the, the statutory change to be part of that. Because for example, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense to pay $50 million for curricular fees if we still allow curricular fees to be charged, for example. You know, um, and, and or or any of the other ones on there. Got it. And so, so it our request would be that if you don't want a policy request to move forward, that the business case, you know, they need to move together. The business case and the policy request uh, would move together, if that makes sense. And uh, Deputy Superintendent Stallings, it, uh, you could probably say it more eloquently than me. Go ahead. So. And Angie, I guess as a follow-up on that, would it be appropriate once we do our business cases, then to, to make that request that these um, the statutory requests that you introduced yesterday, that we um, request that our staff work on those moving forward collectively? Thank you, Vice Chair Belknap. Um, I think that... Um, there was a motion that we as staff provided that could be a possible motion that you send all of these business cases to the governor's office for consideration. What I And then the second part of that motion is and direct staff to open bill files. I think what might make sense if there is something that you are, that the board does not want staff to be seeking either a funding request or it's accompanying policy request, that you could pull that off as something that doesn't even get forwarded to the governor's office. Um, and then, so essentially the, there's a motion to say approval of all business cases and their accompanying policy requests to the governor's office and for staff to work on legislation. If there's an item that you do not want staff to move forward with, it's, I think what Dale mentioned is it makes sense to say, not only don't, move forward on the policy request, but don't move forward on the funding request either. And so I think that that motion, if you were to make that motion, you could say that the board approves the transmittal of these to the governor's office and that Paul, the staff work on legislation with the exception of, and I won't name any program names because I don't, but that would be, I think the way the motion would be, you would take that drafted motion that we have and say, with the exception of, and then you would list any of those either bills at this point, they are funding requests and they may have a policy request associated with it. List the ones you don't want us to move forward with. Hey, um, just just a comment and I don't not I'm not necessarily commenting back to you, Angie, but as a comment, I find that to be um, not our our best route is to move every business case forward and then let the legislature pick and choose what they think are is important to us. I think we need to be more soulful and thoughtful on this. What really makes a difference? Number one, we have to function in our office. 
And then number two, what also leads our children to success and, and academic growth. And so I think uh, I have a really hard time just saying, let's move them all forward. Um, board member Earl. Actually, I think that's exactly what I was gonna say too. I'm not comfortable just saying, send them all on unless we say no. That doesn't feel quite like the right mechanism, so. And Chair Good. B, oh, go ahead. Y yes, go ahead. If I may add to that, um, that has been the general operating procedure in the past, um, that, but, but there are two different things. The governor's office wants to know what are the priorities, but then also what are the needs, you know? And, and what we, if you provide a prioritized list and move them on for consideration, all that happens is that the governor can consider those requests for, to include in his budget. And then as you know, we still have to go to the legislature and go through that whole process. And there may be time if you need to hold any business case, um, we would not have the opportunity to send that to the governor, but we can still send that to the legislature and move forward in a, in a later meeting, if that makes sense, on any business no, case. Dale, that, that gave me full clarification. So now I understand what Angie was saying, is that we're, she's talking about sending it to the governor, not creating our legislative priorities. And, and I mean, not that we can't take priorities to the governor. Angie, is that correct? Is that what you were saying? That is correct, Board Member Belknap. I think that what Dale mentioned is previously, I think every year I've been here um, in the past, we have sent all 30, 40, whatever the number was to the governor's office and then also presented many of those to the legislature. And what um, I think somebody is asking is whether in lieu of sending everything, could you could the board make a motion to say only send you know, these 20 out of 40 or, and that is another way we could absolutely do the motion um, as well. So I think as staff, we're prepared to support you in any way you want. It just has been the practice in prior years for all business cases to move forward, but that is absolutely something that could change. Thank and Chair, you. if I could add just a little more on the process side, Whichever of these business cases, generally, not prioritized or not, that you decide to move on, we load into the governor's budget system for the governor to consider. If you don't move one forward, we, we can't load that into the, the governor's system. They can still choose to add money to whatever program they want, but it wouldn't be our request, if that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, anyone else have any questions, comments, motions? Board member Hart. Hart. Hart was just one by one. Um, or you can clump. That, that uh, or you know, because if you make a motion and you clump them and somebody else wants to divide it, they can do that. Okay. Okay. All right. Vice Chair Davis. Well, I wasn't going to make a motion. I, I think, <laughs> I, I mean, for a starting place, I may move just to take those. Uh, I Not that I, think all of those should be there or in that order or anything, but as a starting place, start with the, the staff 10 priorities and then start puzzling in and out as we want to. But if you'll come back to me, if um, Chair Huntsman doesn't have a motion, then that's probably the motion I'll make just so we can get working on uh, something. Something. Thank you, Vice Chair Davis. Chair Huntsman. Can, can I be heard? Yes. I my connection's pretty bad here. Um, can we get the USBE budget priority that list put back up on the screen, please? Thank you, Dale. I, I'm Vice, Vice Chair Belknap, may I offer something? Yes, that'd be great. So I have two draft motions that I could display. One of them does have the 
USBE superintendency top 10 list, I guess if that's what you want to call it, as the base or a starting point that then we could amend or change from? Would you like me to display that? That would be great. That'd probably be a little easier since we've had the opportunity to look at the finances that go with that. But I'm thinking that board members may want to ask about those deals. So just be prepared. And board member Melnott, may I make one more comment? You bet. There are two motions as um, Dale stated, one is kind of a motion about trend, what you would like to transmit to the governor's office and have staff work on for bills. The second motion, I apologize, they're separated so much, would be about prioritizing. So there are two different aspects that we are hoping for action on today. And you can start with whichever you would like, but one would be about what moves forward to the governor's office and with bill files, that's number one. And action number two would be the prioritization. Thank you. Back to Chair Huntsman. Hey, I was I was wanting to be action number two. I, I think we need to get, we gotta get in the business. We gotta get something on the board. And I personally agree, and I'm sure there's a couple of things that's going to get amended on here, but um, I want to make a motion that the board adopt the USBE superintendent's top 10 budget priorities and transmit to the governor these priorities shown in the budget tracker dated August 5th, 2021 as follows. Number one, WPU value increase. Number two, at-risk WPU add-ons. Number three, critical USBE FTEs. Number four, Eliminate uh, curricular fees. Number five, uh, USBE market adjustments. Number six, Center for Continuous School Improvement. Number seven, Early Warning System Expansion. Number eight, Rural District um, Economies of Scale. Number nine, Full Day Kindergarten Yahoo to Full Day Kindergarten. Number 10, Special Education Teacher Shortage Pilot. That is my motion. You can take the Yahoo. Do we have a second to that? Second. Second by board member straight. Chair Huntsman, would you like to speak to your motion? Um, I think, I, I believe it's a great starting point. I'm in full support of all these programs. I think there's gonna be a couple of tweaks here um, with some amendments, um, but we've got to get started. Thank you, Chair. Oh, let me finish this speak. One more thing. Okay. This is not our end game. This is our beginning. This is our start. We have to get something to the budget. And then we work off this. And as and as many of you know, we we work tire, tirelessly on this clear up through this to through the session. So this is the beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Huntsman. So the motion before the board is as oh, I guess I I do need to read it and then we can have discussion to it. That the board adopts the USBE superintendency's top priorities as directed by leadership, top priorities and transmit to the governor these priorities as shown in the budget tracker dated October 5th, 2021 as follows. And I'm just going to say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, because they are on your screen. Okay, any discussion to this motion, please? Uh, board member Earl. Yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily like this approach at all. I think that we should pick our top needs, not necessarily um, take their needs and that are theirs and go with that. And should I just make an amendment here of the ones I don't want? Is that what I'm just, this is a little frustrating because I think we should go with just our top priorities and not necessarily have to go through and eliminate things that we may have concerns with, with these priorities. Uh -huh. Board member Earl, I can appreciate against that. this motion. That's what okay. I'm saying. No, you can make amendments right now to this and, and you have every opportunity. We now have a motion on the table. And so now you can amend that if you'd like to. Well, I'm, and that's why I'm speaking against this motion in general, that we should just pick our top concerns instead of going off of theirs that I'm. And, yeah. and board member Earl, you can certainly do that, or you can add to this, or you can take away from this. I, I do understand that, so okay. thank you. All right, uh, board member Booth. Uh, 
I am, of course, very supportive of all of the hard work that the superintendency and the staff have gone to to identify what in their minds are the priorities and and wanting to listen and to understand, having studied each of the business cases and watching the videos, um, I can understand why these 10 have ended up in the top 10, but I also have, uh, as you know, uh, additional interests and, uh, and I'm just wanting some clarification on what would be the process uh, to, to uh, move another business case uh, into the top 10 for consideration. Uh, board member Booth, you can either uh, amend it and say you'd like to move something into number two, which would drop something out, or you can say you'd like to move something else into number seven and make it 11 to uh, top 11. So you can do either way that you would like to do that. Do you want to think about it? No, I'm prepared to, uh, so it would be amending the motion. Is that what we're doing? Yes, sir. I would like to amend the motion to insert in the number four position, the BTSALP proposal that uh, we have um, substituted for the original business case that you received documentation on from Dale uh, probably just overnight. For clarity, board member Booth, and do you want to keep a top 10 or do you want it now had to be an 11? I'm happy to keep it at 11 so that as the discussion ensues, we have the input and the opportunity for those who feel so uh, strongly about these first top 10 to be able to express themselves. And I'm, I'm, I'm open. I, I want to be convinced as to what is right for the children of our state and for the staff and the leaders of learning that have to make it happen. Okay, thank you. I just am looking for order. Yes. So I, I don't wanna interrupt, but I just want to ask a point of order question procedurally because um, do we need to decide on the motion if we're going to start with these and then take new motions to make amendments and adjustments because if he is amending this motion then can we only have one more change after that because you can amend the motion and then amend the amendment or then are you planning on taking brand new motions to change what we already voted on in the motion um, for clarity this is what i'm planning on unless someone tells me that i can't that we can do this amendment someone else could do another amendment then we can go back and if we get done with that amendment we can do another amendment and another point of order limitless amendments on this. well you can do limitless amendments i believe um sybil may have to correct me you can only do one amendment to the amendment that that is correct yeah oh got it i got it yes Okay, so we're just going to have to keep track of so, how that's working. Yes. Um, Mark, can I every motion a second also? Um, yeah, I, I still need to get clarity from him first, Carol. Okay. On that. So, um, I, I'm sorry. Uh, Chair Huntsman, did you have something about procedure as well here? Yes. Yeah, so I, you're... I believe your honorable parliamentarian will definitely comment on this. And this was, it's about, it's the only way you can really do business to get something on the table. And then, and then of course, time's your enemy. So use your time wisely, but it, it'll eventually end up at a ball. It could end up at a point where somebody goes to previous question and then it's done. But I don't believe anyone's wanting to do that. I think the intent here to get something started see what gets traction um, and work through this. Again, this is a starting process, not the end. Okay, and then I, I got a second from board member Lear and um, I do need some clarifying questions too, but um, board member Hart, are you talking about the amendment? No, I was gonna okay. make 
Okay. Um, Dr. Dixon? Yeah, this is just about the amendment, but also just in general. I'll just punctuate. Nobody should feel like they have to um, walk on eggshells, step on toes, feel bad. Uh, you know, again, this is a task we were given. We worked on it together to try and come up with a place for you to start. So um, just that that's all this is. So um, it's not an us and them. It's a we. And um, just know that you don't, as you make these decisions and make amendments, it's you don't have to worry about us as staff. We're just here to help and support the process. Thank you, Dr. Dixon. Um, let, let me just see. Um, Board Member Booth, would you like to speak to your amendment? Uh, I sent all of you a text just a few minutes ago um, where my thoughts from overnight <laughs> in between the our wonderful meetings that we've been spending so much time together in, um, where I've expressed myself and in the middle of some of the deliberations, we have a chance to, with Carol's help, I shortened it. You'll be grateful that you got the edited version rather than the, the longer version. Carol is great for brevity. Um, but I think that everything has been expressed in writing that I need to say, I just believe this is a key moment to make a difference in all of our lives, most importantly, the students that we have responsibility for in light of this pandemic and the healing that needs to take place and the learning uh, gaps that need to be closed. This could be a great opportunity. Uh, and so I'm very grateful for the opportunity for us to consider this as one of our top priorities. Thank you, board member Booth. Chair Huntsman. Um, yes, I I, I want to propose an amendment to the amendment, um, and then I'll speak to it. I I propose we take the BTS arts in all schools and move it to item eleven. And if I can get a second, I'd like to to speak to that. Second, Moss. Uh, board member Moss or Hutchings, either one. You can take either one of those as a second. Okay, uh, Chair Huntsman, you would like to speak to that amendment? Everyone loves um, Be the Beverly Terry Sorensen's arch program. And for years, I've advocated for it up on the Hill as it's been part of our legislative ask. I, and, and they will get funded. There will be a portion funded or all funded, a lot funded. My, my experience in the past is it just has to be on our radar. But if it takes the number four spot and it's already in super favor, huge favor of, of the governor's office and then also the legis legislature, um, then, it get, then it takes one of our other priorities away. And so I, I'm, I'm not speaking against um, Beverly Taylor Sorensen uh, arts in all of our school proposal here, but I think we send a message um, if it's in a super, super high priority over full day kindergarten, um, early warning system expansion, uh, uh, the special education teacher shortage. I, I think it just sends a different um, message on the priority side. Thank you, Chair. Board Member Lair, are you speaking to the amendment? To the amendment? Yes. Um, I I hear Chair Huntsman, and I know that's a huge concern. My competing concern: every one of these should be number one. Literally, I mean, these are literally my my first choice is two, but we have for years um, sort of taken the same approach that Chair Huntsman just expressed, that legislators like BTS, but we are at a point where we have got to let, I believe, we've got to let the Sorensen family off the hook. This private family has supported a program that continues to grow and thrive in our schools, and so we don't just need the same funding we've always had. We need more. 
And I'm not sure four is the perfect placement, but I think we need to signal to legislators. I think the board, my opinion is we signal to legislators, this is a program that's proven itself. It, it has improved math grades. We've got data. This is not just um, a nice idea anymore. And I, so I think we need the, the additional funding to support the program in the schools uh, without the, uh, the extreme generosity of the Sorensen families. So I do support moving it up. I don't know exactly where because I every one of these would be number one, but I would support the I don't support number 11 right now. I would support higher up on the food chain. Thank you, board member. Lear. Board member Earl, are you speaking to the amendment to the amendment? I am. Thank you. Uh, wait, what is the amendment to the amendment to to move, move Beverly to Taylor Sorensen's priority to 11? OK. Yes, I would leave it where it's at. I think we should be using um, our funding to, in this type of an area versus putting so much into social emotional package programs. Um, this is where the research is. It's things that actually expand uh, capacity in children. We're, we're investing so much in so many different things, hoping to achieve so many objectives. Um, this type of programming, I think, is the is the right direction to go for our students. I would keep it a top priority. Remove some of these others, especially. Well, I'll speak to some others in a minute. But yes, thank you, Board Member Earl. Board Member uh, Chair Huntsman. Um, this is a question for staff. Um, I don't know, and this is a question on our our, our federal COVID money, but. It, um, I don't know of any LEAs that have used any of that um, or have heard about it, used any of that money to expand on their existing Beverly Taylor Swanson art program. And, and so the question to staff is, have they, are they, and is it, or, and was it eligible? I don't know if staff could answer that question. Uh, Chair Belknap, I, you know, I'm wondering if uh, Sarah Young's in this group with us. She might be. I, I'm not aware, from my vantage point, specifically of any LEA using it towards uh, Beverly Taylor Sorensen and any of that funding. But you know, Sarah would have more insight on that since the reimbursement requests are coming through her staff. So, Chair, I'm not sure that we have an answer yet. And, and Chair, let me, oh, uh, yeah, I was Dr. just going to look at the business case because we did ask that question for every business case. Let me see what it said. Okay, and while you're looking that up, maybe board member Booth can help me. What is the amount that is, because uh, I can't look at my other phone and do this at the same time. What is the amount that you are asking for for the um, uh, Beverly Taylor Sorensen project? What is the amount? 12.7 million. And and then Dell, thank you, board member Booth. Dell, can you tell me what they received last year? Uh, BTS received 2 million last year. It went from 10.8 to 12.8 million. The, the original request was for a five-year phase in at 4.4 million. And uh, the updated request would be at a complete phase in in year one at 12.7 million. Thank you. Okay, Dell, do you have a response back? Um, I have one, Madam Chair, if you okay. want to respond. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Dixon. So Sarah is listening in. Um, we're not aware of any LEA that has spent money on BTSA. And I, you know, we have been um, we, we've we've very, been very strategic and cautious with our LEAs to um, when they talk about investing in personnel, because these are one-time short-term monies, then to be able to expand a program is very problematic if you're investing lesser dollars in this kind of program. So that that's why we're not aware of any. We just haven't seen any any come through. But it's been in part as they look at the type of funds that they're getting and the parameters on those funds. Would it qualify? Maybe, depending on how it's related to COVID. 
Um, and that's the that's the key always. How is this related to COVID? So when you're talking about expansion, that's definitely not um, n- not uh, the proper use of ESSER funds. Thank you. Okay, seeing no other hands, the, um, oh, Vice Chair Davis. Are you speaking to the uh, amendment? You, yes, and a quick question. We're talking about ongoing funds here. Yeah. Yes, ongoing funds, okay. Um, yeah, I, on the amendment to the amendment, I mean, I'll probably vote no. I don't think it should be number 11. I, I also don't think it may be number four. <laughs> so I don't know. I'm guessing all these are going to shuffle around a bit. Um, but I will say this. I've seen the power of the arts in our schools and for our students. And um, in, a, in a textured time, I think we could use more of it and not less. So I, I support the idea in general, just a little higher maybe. Thank you, Vice Chair Davis. Okay, oh, board member Strait. We're out of amendments, right? Yes, on this okay. right now, right now we are. Okay. okay, all right, thanks board member Strait. Okay, so the amendment to the amendment is to uh, change the priority from four to 11. Um, uh, all in favor, um, you know what? I think we're just gonna have to do a roll call, Cindy. I don't think we can track this, okay? That's so, fine. I'll help, board, right. Okay, everyone be ready. It's in alphabetical order, okay? Board member Booth. No. Cannon. Sorry, board member Cannon. Board member Cannon. I haven't seen her on. Okay. Uh, Board member Klein? No. Board member Davis? No. Board member Earl? No. Board member Hansen? Yes. Board member Hart? No. Board member Huntsman, a chair Huntsman? Uh, Yes. Board member Hutchings? Yes. Board member Hymas? Yes. Board member Lear? No. Board member Moss? Yes. Board member Norton? Board member Norton. Board member Strait? Oh, no. Okay. Board member Strait? Yes. And board member Bell, that yes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That amendment, uh, uh, the amendment to the amendment fell. So we're back to the original amendment that the board adds the BTS arts in all schools funding request to a priority item number four. Any discussion to that amendment? Seeing none, we'll go through here. Uh, board member Booth? Yes. Board member, uh, board member Klein? Yes. Uh, Vice Chair Davis? Yes. Board member Earl? Yes. Board member Hansen? No. Board member Hart? Yes. Vice uh, Chair Huntsman? Yes. Uh, board member Hutchings? Yes. Board member Hymas? No. Board member Lear? Yes. Board member Moss? Yes. Board member Norton? Yes. Board member Strait? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> board board member uh, Belknap is a no. So it's a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. That that um, amendment passes. So now the our, the motion on the table is uh, you can see the whole thing how it is there instead of me reading the whole thing. Board member Straight. Yes, yeah, so I'd like to make a motion to move number four and to number 10 and number 10 to number four. So flip those. Flip. 
You need a second? Yeah, I'm going to need a second. I was just thinking about it. I'm, I'm good to second. Okay. So the motion is, is that we would move number four to number 10, which is the Beverly Taylor Sorensen's to number 10 and full day kindergarten to number four. Um, would you like to speak to your motion, board member Strait? Yes, and I apologize for not turning on my video. My That's internet okay. connection is unstable. <laughs> and so uh, hopefully it keeps up here. So I'm for everything on this list, including the other ones that are still down the line that we'll probably talk about. Uh, full day kindergarten has been on the docket for a long time. It's something of, of general uh, importance. And uh, I just think it's time to, to move that up the, the docket. I know that I'm, I'm uh, very much in favor of uh, the school's school fees, and I, I kind of see that as right there with it, but in the element of, of uh, how long this has been an issue that needs to be addressed, I, I think that's where I'd like it to be. Uh, heck, top 10 is top 10, so I don't think this is really a demotion. I just think it's putting it in a better, in a better stance as far as uh, what, in my mind, are, are our top 11 priorities at this point. Thank you. Oh, sorry, that was me talking. Board Member Earl, uh, speaking to the amendment, moving four to 10 and 10 to four. I'm not speaking to the amendment. Thank you. Um, Board Member Hart, speaking to the amendment. I'm not speaking. Thank you. you. You were speaking, but not to that. Okay, Board Member Hutchings. Just a, actually a quick question about the extended day kindergarten. My understanding is extended day kindergarten is a choice that parents can choose. Is that correct throughout the state or can, is it required in some schools and a choice in others? Well, I'll let someone else answer it, but we're talking about a full day kindergarten option in this case is what I read in the business case, that this is for every district to have where families can choose to go to full day kindergarten. Um, can somebody um, correct me on that if that's not correct, that this is still a, an option for parents? Yes, this is Sarah with Key Pre-K through 12 Literacy and Library Media Coordinator. I can speak to that. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, currently, uh, as uh, Dale was talking about, we fund half-day kindergarten in Utah by the 0.55 WPU. So this request would be to, within three years, it would be a roll-up to fund it with the full WPU, just like it is in grades one through 12. Um, but it would still remain optional. So if parents felt like that wasn't the best fit for their child, they would not have to, they would not be required to attend full day. Can I ask a quick follow-up? Yes, go ahead, board member Hutchings. Could a parent choose to have their student enrolled in a partial day kindergarten after this change takes place? Or is it full day or nothing? No, they can choose half day if they choose. Yep, half day would still be an available option for parents who feel that's the best, their best option for their child. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, board member Hutchings. Um, uh, board member Booth. I'd like to am amend the amendment. Okay. I would like to move a uh, full day kindergarten to number four and just push BTS arts to number five. Yeah, I was just I was just looking at that. So um, do I have a second to that um, amendment to the amendment? Second. Thank you. I think that was board member Lear. Um, thank you. Board member Booth, would you like to speak to that? Or <laughs> I don't know, maybe you've done it. No, I just I feel I certainly resonate with the importance of full day kindergarten. And uh, I've got a lot of littles in my family that would appreciate that opportunity. 
but moving BTS arts all the way down to 10 uh, is, I don't feel fair to the children. I'd like to ask all of the members of the board to come up with a picture of their grandchildren and cross out the 50% that you would like to not have arts experiences uh, in the next five years. Uh, and as I look at my little kids' faces and putting a big black X over their faces, I can't feel good about that. So I'm just asking for uh, a little bit better chance moving to number five. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Booth. Okay, um, so uh, speaking to the amendment, Chair Huntsman, are you speaking to this um, amended amendment to the amendment? Um, I wanted to speak to the full day kindergarten. Is that appropriate? It would be because that's part of this amendment to move it. Part of the amendment. Um, I don't want to advocate any stronger hour than well, I, I have in the past on full day kindergarten, but can can staff comment on um, for the last couple of years, we've had so much funding available for full day kindergarten. And did we meet? Did we meet that expectation or was it was it limited and uh, with a desire to have more? They, they have the data because we've had our business cases. So can, is there someone from staff that can com comment on the, the, the um, LEA request for? Oh. Yeah. Thank you, Chair Huntsman. And I see Sarah is on here. Now, Sarah, you also had your Funding hand raised. For full day. Sorry. So, Sarah, if you would answer Chair Huntsman's question, then whatever you were going to speak on as well. I think it was probably still up from the last comment. My absolute okay. apologies. <laughs> um, and I, I think I heard most of uh, Board Huntsman's uh, comments but or questions, but I may have missed it. Would it be possible for him to repeat it? Because there was a little bit of cutting in and out. And I want to make sure I respond well, correctly. He's he's cutting in and out, but he wanted to know, I, I believe, and then he can correct me. If, did we use our OEK and, and, and where are we, you know, what is the percentage and growth in kids by having full day kindergartens? I believe that was his route. He can correct me if I'm wrong. Great. Right. I can a little bit, but that'd be great to get that answer is the, the request to, to it was very limited in the past. Um, and what has it been in the last, the recent couple of years, we've reported on this the legislature, as I recall for this couple of years. Okay, so Sarah, I think he wanted you to look at what we were we were reporting up to the legislature on this area. Did I now lose Sarah? No, I'm here. There you are, Sarah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So it, as far as the percentage, which it sounds like was one of the things requested. Um, so in previous years, when we were asking for funds, we were at about 20 to 22 percent of students uh, in our state that were accessing full day kindergarten or had access to full day kindergarten based on the funding amounts we had at the time. We are now up to 30 percent of our students. Um, and so as far as the outcomes, which is sort of the other piece of that question, uh, students who received the uh, full day kindergarten outperformed half day and extended day kindergarten students. Um, Pre-COVID, it was four times better. And even after COVID, it's still two times better uh, as far as outcomes. So I hope that I, I'm hoping I caught all of his, his questions. And if not, feel free to ask again. Um, thank you. It's hard because he's he's cutting in and out. Um, let's just see what else. Oh, by the way, I saw in the news last night that uh, across the country, 60 to 80 percent of kids in this country have optional full day kindergarten across the country. And Utah's at 30 percent. I just thought I'd say that out loud. OK, um, chair, uh, I was going to call you chair. Uh, board member Hansen, you haven't had opportunity to speak. I have another motion. Okay, then keep keep your hand up. Vice Chair Davis. Thanks. I I probably will vote for this amendment only because um, I am concerned about the capital 
requirement. So if we're going to, you know, double our kindergarten classrooms, it's going to take capital because you don't just find space. Oftentimes you have to build space. And in our last recent meeting, our rural superintendent said in order to be able to access, if we do get the full day kindergarten, that they can't do it without the capital funds that have been requested in the JLC. So, uh, so I do think it's great for the parents to have the option who want it and I would support it, but I'm not sure that I'd move it up that far because if we do end up with it in our top 10, I'm also going to move that we plug into the bottom with one other thing, um, that 250 million request for capital funds. Um, so that's the only reason why I'm kind of holding steady at this point. Thank you. Um, board member Norton, are you speaking to this? No, I have a different motion. Okay. Thank you. And I think everyone else. Oh, uh, Sarah. Yes. Thank you. If, if I, if I may, uh, just wanted to comment that we, uh, absolutely agree with what you were just saying about the, um, needing more space. And so what we did is we had a group that included many LEAs and asked them, you know, if we were to offer this option, would you be able to? And they said, not, not right away, not next year, which is why the business case is a three-year roll-up because they said that within three years, that was a possibility, but they couldn't do it right away next year. So, um, so that's why we went ahead and just did a, a three-year roll-up so that they will, they'll have some time to get those things in place. Thank you, Sarah, for that clarity. I think that's very helpful. All right, so we have on the table an amendment to the amendment. Sarah, your hand's still up. Um, that the board move um, number 10 to number four and number four to number five. Um, I don't see any other, oh wait, Brent, you have a new hand up. I'm just gonna defend uh, not moving number five on curricular fees down to five. Uh, it's it's one of our best equity pieces in regards to uh, bringing equity to uh, our schools in regards to fees. We talk about free public education and then we charge them a lot of fees. There's changes that we need to fund at some point because changes are coming one way or another. Thank you, Brent. Okay, so the amendment be, the amendment to the amendment before the board is that we move um, number 10 to number four and number four to number five. Um, let's do a quick roll call vote. Be ready because we're going to go in order alphabetically. Board member Booth. Yes. Board member Klein. No. Board member Vice Chair Davis. No. Board member Earl. No. Board member Hansen. No. Board member Hart. No. Board member Chair Huntsman, sorry. I'll come back. Maybe. Um, Board member Hutchings? No. Board member Hymas? No. Board member Lear? Yes. Board member Moss? No. Board member Norton? Yes. Board member Strait? No. Okay, that amendment fails. Okay, so now we're back to the original amendment, which is that the board moves number four to number 10 and number 10 to number four. Do you, sorry, Chair, want to check back and see if Chair Huntsman is, can be heard yet? Chair Huntsman, are you, can we hear you on that last vote? I was, can you hear me now? Yes. I was a no. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Cindy. Okay, so we are, I know that these other three are up for, here for something else. So seeing no hands, the amendment um, to the to motion would be to move number four to number 10 and number 10 to number four. Be ready here. Board member Booth. Um, no. Board member Klein. No. 
or Vice Chair Davis? No. Board Member Earl? No. Board Member Hansen? No. Board Member Hart? No. Board Member Hunts, uh, Chair Huntsman? <laughs> no. Uh, Board Member Hutchings? No. Board Member Hymas? No. Board Member Lear? No. Board Member Moss? No. Board Member Norton? No. Board Member Strait? Oh, no. Okay. All right. So let's move on to the next. Um, now we're back here and we kind of have an order of where people have come in. So we're now uh, board member Earl. Yes, I would move that we remove Center for Continuous School Improvement and early warning systems from our list. Do I need do a I have a Do I have a second to that? Second. Second by board member Klein. Board member Earl, would you like to speak to that? Yes, I will speak to that. The We just passed yesterday millions of dollars of programming for entities to do the very same thing they're asking to do, which is uh, professional learning for educators and leaders, highly uh, promoting highly equitable access to highly... Anyways, I'm going to talk quick here. But anyway, it just feels like we are doing a lot of the same things, funding a lot of the same things with a lot of different entities. And then also on the early warning system, I have concerns with the early warning system we're using in this case. It's not you get to pick it. it from my understanding, it's Panorama. And this is an extensive data collection system as well as their um, aligning with um, the transformational social emotional learning goals on a broader sense. So I I just have concerns. I don't want these a priority. That's my reasons. Thank you, board member Earl. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to this motion? Um, I think board member Lear. Um, yeah, <clears throat> yes. I'd like, I'd like to hear and I'm trying to take my, I'm kind of, anyway, I won't give up on my video. Um, I'm, I'd like to hear from whoever is the uh, staff person in charge of this and uh, maybe uh, hear why, why it was, why the staff's feeling was, and I know it wasn't, it, it was a, it was a joint decision and I'm not trying to put this on anyone, but I'd like to hear why this was uh, in the top 10 um, from the superintendent's oh, perspective, let me the, see. the group's perspective. I'm looking. We have oh. Tracy Vandeventer that can speak to this. Thank you, Miss Tracy, are you there? Absolutely, thank you very much. This is Tracy Vandeventer, director of the Center for Continuous School Improvement. Uh, although I was not involved in ranking uh, and identifying the top 10, I certainly feel strongly about the work that we are trying to do and want to honor that uh, board member Earl is pointing out there's a lot of initiatives out there that are intended uh, to support schools. The truth is everything that takes place at the State Board of Education is with the intent, right, of school improvement and in making sure that all of our students and our staff are supported and that the schools are on that continuous improvement cycle. I think one thing that we've been noticing is that there isn't as much alignment of our efforts as we would like to see, and we're hoping to build some efficiency in that process. And at the same time, we recognize that there are some needs, especially with data, where uh, we have a number of LEAs that have been requesting to have information about where their schools are in the ranking um, prior to their being designated as a school that's in improvement. And we haven't been able to respond to those needs uh, directly and look to have uh, more support specifically in you know, giving information directly to the LEAs. So our, our intent is that uh, we, we wanna try to help pull together all the different sections within USBE uh, and have a framework that would allow the 
the support we're providing LEAs to be uh, more direct and, and uh, to be aligned so that the work is efficient and we're making the best use of all those funds that have been set aside for improvement. Can I speak to that, to, the, to my uh, comment also? Um, yes, but I was going to make a comment first, Carol, and this isn't because you're making a comment, but oh. I'd like to remind everyone we have 30 minutes left, and so we need to just be totally efficient. So, Carol, please speak Wait, to it. Thank you. Briefly. I'm concerned we're putting a lot of money into suicide prevention and a number of mental health concerns for students that our suicide rate is, is disturbingly and embarrassingly high. For young people and i think if we really care about this we've got to make it a priority i so i i'm reluctant to take number eight off but they're lumped together so i i think i have to say i i would uh vote against this amendment because i am we've, we've got to do something to address the mental health of students and we're not being successful thank you carol um i i have kind of skipped over uh, board member Hansen, because I thought he was making a different motion, but board member Hansen, is that correct? Thanks, um, Chair Bell, Vice Chair Belknap. I, I do have a different motion, but I also would like to speak to this, um, particularly on number seven, the continuous school improvement. Um, before my latest stint um, in employment as an attorney, I worked for about 20 years in manufacturing, um, dealing specifically with lean manufacturing and continuous improvement in that arena. Um, I, in our company, we were a global company and every um, facility that we had was in need of improvement. And I saw the benefit of building up resources to facilitate improvement inside the company so that they could be deployed to the areas that needed them most. And also to um, just companies that were doing their normal business to help them improve as they go. I think the same thing applies to our schools. And I've been just uh, sick seeing us hire outside experts to come in and help us with, for example, school turnaround, um, have them learn what's going on in our schools, make suggestions, help us improve, and then leave and take that knowledge with them. I think that if we are, if we are serious about improvement, we should build up resources at USBE. Um, that would mean bringing in improvement specialists, being able to collect data, being able to share best practices, being able to help um, schools to group together and learn from each other, and also to um, have a, a consistent approach for improvement that we could deploy everywhere. So we have our brand of improvement and not whatever expert we hire to come in have it be their brand of improvement. Um, so I would speak against moving seven off the list. I think that's very important for our future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just trying to look for new hands. Carol, your hand is still up. Um, uh, board member Moss. Uh, thank you. Quick question. I, I, I appreciate member Lear's, or excuse me, member Earl's um concerns about this as i look through the business case part of it seems to suggest that if this is implemented as intended it might result in greater efficiencies and actually streamlining of multiple programs um, kind of going to that concern i i just i'm i'm curious if that's the plan uh it seems to be and and sometimes you spend more in order ultimately to spend less you, you put time in to ultimately spend less time in, in kind of competing or overlapping efforts. And, and if that's the intent here, I would just perhaps maybe just, if somebody could address, address that part of it. Is that, is that kind of what we're getting after here? I think that would go back to Ms. Tracy. Tracy? Uh, absolutely, Board Member Moss. I do believe that is an essential piece, although I don't think it is the only piece. I see it as really threefold. I see us as building efficiency and continuing to align the 
improvement efforts across the State Board of Education. I also see that we are lacking in data information that needs to be shared and distributed out to LEA specific to their work at individual building levels, as well as their own LEA work, uh, and so that they can reflect on the ways that they're supporting. We want to build capacity of the LEAs to be able to support improvement efforts in their area. And the third piece is really looking at some of those schools that are not receiving support at all at this point. So that would be those TSI schools that are identified but have not been receiving any uh, really specific and, and uh, direct support. We also have those schools that have recently exited from uh, turnaround status and we'll have some coming up that are going to be exiting CSI status. We feel that it's important that we provide them with some support in continuing their improvement efforts after their designation has been removed, knowing that they're continuing on in their journey. So there's sort of a tier two level of support we would like to build prior to them experiencing sort of that funding cliff that will happen once those funds have been removed. Thank you, Ms. Tracy. Um, board member Hart. Um, I'm, I'm all for continuous school improvement completely and 100%. My issue though is I don't see where um, this couldn't be done without a business case. I don't see where um, this adds, then it looks like adding positions. I, I don't see there to be anything that would stop us from um, perhaps reorganizing or creating multidisciplinary teams within the department. I just, I just see it. Um, <clears throat> I, I just don't see where it's necessary beyond um, what we already have. Um, I think that's just a comment. So that's, that's, I will, I will be voting for this. Thank, thank you, board member Hart. Uh, Chair Huntsman. Um, yes, I'll be really brief. Can I be heard? I apologize yes. for my technical difficulties. I'm speaking in favor of this um, with some of the positive uh, I'm adding. I don't I want to add, but I support the positive comment to keep the seven and eight in place. But the Center for Continuous School Improvement is going to prevent schools that are going that find themselves in turnaround. It's we um, Representative Moss passed a bill and, and, and advocated really hard. How do we bring all of our best practices into one place? How can we can't build and roll our own? We have too many outside influences coming in to try to support and help. I would rather have them all in-house, in-state, um, and capitalize on the great resources that, that we already have. In order to do it, you have to have a designated place, position, and process and processes in place for access and sharing. And I see the Center for Continuous School Improvement to not only be reactive to problems, but being um, preventative uh, in helping to make good education happen. So I'm, I'm uh, in favor of leaving both. Uh, I'm not in favor of the proposed uh, motion that's on the table. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Hussman. Um, Vice Chair Davis. I move to divide the question. Okay, um, so to, we're gonna divide the question and you're just making seven. And what do you want to do with them? Vote on them separately. Thank you. And, and, and to clarify also, this is just to remove from the priority list, not the whole list that's gonna go to the governor, right? Correct. That is correct. Do I have a second to divide the motion? Second. Second by board member Hansen. Uh, Vice Chair Davis, would you like to speak to that? Yeah, just briefly, I'll speak to it. I, I think um, I would support keeping the Center for Continuous School Improvement in our own area. Um, they're doing good things for schools. I get great reports with this last go round of <laughs> some frustration that one of our schools had and they were like this, you know, the team has been so helpful, but I really feel like we need to um, support our team and be able to do some preventative things, not just help on the back end when schools are already in turnaround. Um, and 
honestly, it's not that I don't like the early warning system expansion, but that's not something that we control or do within our area. And there is a legislature on the Hill that will be a fierce advocate for that and may not be for some of our programs that, that we work on. So I'm, I'm, I'm okay taking that one off. Thank you, Vice Chair Davis. Okay, so the the motion now, the amended motion, the, the divided motion is to vote on number seven and number eight separately um, to be taken off. Um, let's see, board member Earl, you have your hand up. Is this something new for this conversation? Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Davis, you keeping your hand up for something else? Thank you. No. I know that the others are, so I'm just trying to get this so I don't miss anyone. All right, so the divided motion is number, we'll do number seven first. Um, the divided motion is to remove um, number seven from our priority list. Um, we'll take a quick roll call vote. Again, I mean, a, a vo voice call vote. Please be ready. We will go in alphabetical order. Board member Booth. What? Chair Did husband? we vote to divide? Did we yeah. already vote to divide? Oh, crummy. We didn't. Oh, I'm we, just. Thank I'm, you, Chair. Okay. Let's okay. Uh, um, then this is what we're doing. We're voting to. to oh, wait. Do we have a second on that to divide? Okay. Chair I husband. seconded. Oh, thank you, Scott. I'd Bye. forgotten who did that. Thank you so much, Scott. Okay. So the motion before us is to divide. Board member Booth? Yes. C Board member Klein? No. Vice Chair Davis. Yes. Board Member Earl. No. Vice Chair, Han I mean, Chair, Han I mean, <laughs> Board Member Hanson. Yes. <laughs> I tried to call you Chair Hanson all morning. Um, Board Member Hart. Yes. Chair Huntsman. Yes. Board Member Hutchings. Yes. Board Member Hymas. Yes. Board Member Lear. Yes. Board Member Moss. Yes. Board Member Norton. Yes. Board Member Strait. Board Member Strait. Yes. Okay, thank you. That passes with two no votes. Uh, board Member Klein, Board Member Earl. So now that we are divided this question, we will go back to number seven, and that is to remove um, item number seven from the priority list. Um, do, uh, please, do we have any more discussion to that? <laughs> Good, seeing none, um, I will go ahead and make a vote on that. Board member Booth? No. Board member Klein? Yes. Board member Davis? No. Board member Earl? Yes. Board member Hanson? No. Board member Hart. I'm sorry, what are we voting on? On to remove number seven from the priority list. Uh, yes. Chair Huntsman. No. Board member Hutchings. No. Board member Hymas. Yes. Board member Lear. No. Board member Moss. No. Board member Norton. No. Board member Strait. No. So we have, um, I, I don't know who's tracking this. Are you tracking this, Sybil? There's nine no's, so the motion fails. And the, so the motion fails. Okay, so we're not moving. It. So the next item is, is that we remove the funding item number eight from our priority list. Any discussion? Don't see any new hands. Board member Booth. Yes. Board member Klein. Yes. Board member Davis. Yes. Uh, board member Earl. Yes. Board member Hanson. Yes. Board member Hart. I'm sorry. Which can you use Wait. the name of? What I'm sorry. We're, we're mo moving number eight, the early warning system expansion from the top. Oh. Okay. All right. Yes. I'm sorry, Board Member Hart. I'll be more clear next time. Well, Thank you. I, I'm I'm working off an old list. I'm sorry. 
Uh, it's okay. I, I get that. I understand. Okay. I, I would like early warning systems struck. So whatever the vote. That is a yes. So Chair okay. Huntsman. Yes. Chair Huntsman. Well, I put it up there, so I'm going to stay with my no. No. Okay. Uh, Board Member Hutchings. Yes. Uh, Board Member Hymas. Yes. Board Member Lear. No. Uh, Board Member Moss. Yes. Board Member Norton. Yes. Board Member Strait. Yes. Okay, so that that passes. So priority number eight comes off the top 10 list now, which is that's where we are. It's at a top 10, right? Well, you still have a yeah, there it top, is. Top 10. You just don't have that. Now you have a different top 10. Yeah, we have a different top 10. Okay, so we're going to go back here. And I believe the the, the first person on this list that is there was um, board member Norton. Uh, yes, I would like to move to add a cadence reading in grades six through eight as number 10 and move special education oh teacher shortage pilot down to 11. Thank you. Do we have a second to that motion? I'll second that. Thank you, board member Strait. Uh, board member Norton, would you like to speak to that? Yes, I would. Last year, this group um, prioritized adding a cadence through fourth and to sixth grade, and that was passed in the legislature. Unfortunately, there was an inadvertent oversight, and the sixth graders who were in elementary school were given that opportunity this year. However, the sixth graders that are in an intermediate, middle, or junior high school were left off of that um, and were not funded. Uh, at that, so that is the, the purpose behind this. Um, at the same time, we are asking to increase this to grade eight um, as they are noting a significant um, problem in secondary now that, that uh, there are many students who are having some literacy issues and this has proved to be a very effective way to help monitor and work with those students who are having problems with their reading or their literacy problems. Thank you, Board Member Norton. Um, I think Chair Hansen's there for, I mean, Board Member Hansen's there for something else and Board Member Hart. Um, Board Member Earl, are you speaking to this? Yeah, I'm gonna speak against it. I'm, and I, this is probably a great program um, for those upper grades. I just, a district needs to be committed to that enough that they're investing in it if they wanna use it. I just think we're just adding more and more and more things. And I'm, I'm not for expanding things, especially with all that's going on um, in our schools right now, more, more products and more things. And I'm, like I said, if, if they're invested enough to invest, you know, to put the money into it, then let them use it. I just have concerns that a half of these things on here are just expansions to things that are gonna be having to be done in the schools. Um, and I, I'm, I'm just not for it. Okay, thank you, Jenny. Just as a reminder, we have about 12 minutes left. Board Member Klein. I just had a question on, on Acadians. How long have we been using it? And if it works the way it's supposed to, why are we having to expand into sixth through eighth grade? Shouldn't we be getting better and better at helping our kids improve their reading? It, to me, expanding it tells me it's not working. Am I wrong it, in that? It's, it's actually a, a, a diagnostic. A cadence is di diagnostic where okay. they fall out in reading. It's not a program that teaches reading. Okay. Did that answer your question? I, I'm answering it and I didn't turn to staff. I think so. Okay. Thank you, Board Member Klein. Okay. And you still have your hand up. Did you have so something else on this? Okay. A Board Member Strait, do you have something else on this? Yeah, so I'm not entirely familiar with this. So, uh, Board Member Norton, could could you maybe help me understand? I know it's a diagnostic test. I knew that much. I know it's very 
labor intensive. It takes a lot of time. Uh, but what happens after you get the information or what does that information, that data look like and how does it, how does it change the outcome? What that does is it shows you if a child is, for instance, it, it, it drills down right to the point where is this child missing their vowel consonant vowels? If so, then that helps the teacher know, oh, this is what this group of students needs to work on is vowel consonant vowels. Or maybe it's the blends and maybe this student can't blend or the this, this student is having problems blending their O-U-G-H. And so they can, they can work on those particular skills. So that's what this, this test does is we do it beginning, middle and end of year. And it, it helps them learn those particular things. Also, it um, provides some reading comprehension. It, it shows is, is the problem with fluency, is it with reading comprehension, et cetera. So that kind of gives you a rough overview. It, it just basically takes the reading process and breaks it down and helps teachers then know what those particular students need to work on. Also, this is, you know, to add on to this, this is kind of an equity issue because we've got sixth graders who are giving this opportunity and sixth graders who were left out of this just based on the building that they attend sixth grade in. So what would you say to the, because board member Klein mentioned that, well, if we have to expand it, it must not be working. Do you have a response to that? I don't, I actually do, Brent, and, and, and so and rather than you and board member Norton going back and forth, it, she didn't know it was a diagnostic. She thought it was a reading program. Did that answer that for you, Brent? Thank you. Okay. Uh, Vice Chair Davis. I'm just going to speak against this, not that I don't think it would be great to have additional opportunities for assessment if the teachers want to use them. And I believe this is optional, not a forced thing. But um, we really need our special education. We have a teacher shortage in special ed, and I don't want it pushed off our top 10 list. Um, it's pretty crucial. And, and I also think that we may need to come back and talk more about special education later. And I'll say this quickly. We're going to work on some research why there are why carry forward why needs why why the 12 percent rule didn't pass you know there are a lot of questions we have about special ed we've got some delving to do still before the session we may come back and talk about special ed again in these top priorities i feel but for now we do know this we have a, a big shortage and this can help with ongoing funds um, to help that problem Thank you. Board Member Strait? Would it be out of order if to uh, make an amendment if you were the second? Um, <laughs> it's, actually, it's actually not. You can make an amendment to this amendment. Okay, so I move that we uh, switch number eight and number 11. So we keep a cadence, but we put it behind those others. Okay, so the motion, the, the amended, the amendment to the amendment is to move number eight to number 11. Do I have a second for that? Second. Okay, board member Strait, do you want to speak to that? Well, I, I just was acknowledging uh, board member Davis's concern and and I see the number 11 as being a broader based thing, although you can say sixth to eighth grade. I, I, that's just where I feel like maybe it belongs. I, I, like, the, I like this, I like this diagnostic. Uh, we need the information or to make improvement, but we have these other issues as well. So I'm just trying to put it where I felt it belonged because I'm not for or against, you know, just taking it off. Thank you, board member Strait. Okay, seeing no other hands at this time, the amendment to the amendment is that we would move number eight that's on the screen, which is a cadence reading grade six through eight to number 11, which is special education teacher shortage pilot. And we we flip those, right? New eight with number 11, yes. 
All right. Any more discussion to that? Okay, seeing none, um, we're going to go for a vote. Board Member Booth? Yes. Board Member Klein? No. Board Member Davis? Yes. Board Member Earl? No. Board Member Hansen? Yes. Board Member Hart? No. Board Member Chair Huntsman? Yes. Uh, board member Hutchings? No. Board member Hymas? No. Board member Lear? Yes. Board member Moss? No. Board member Norton? Yes. Board member Strait? Yes. Okay, what do you have there, Sybil? I have seven yeses. Uh, the noes are member Klein, Earl, Hart, Hutchins, Hymas, and Moss. <laughs> so so that, that fails? That, that carries with seven yeses and one, two, three, four, six, six noes. It, it doesn't eight, eight. Can carry because I'm a no on that one. Oh, so. okay. So that, that doesn't carry. That doesn't carry. Okay, so now we're back to the uh, amendment, which is that the board added Cadence reading grades six through eight to number eight. Wait a minute. And, and number 10 to 11. Okay, seeing no more hands. Um, going to vote. So what we're doing, what we're, it's what's on the screen that a Cadence reading would, would go to number eight and special education teacher shortage would go to number 11. Board member Booth. No. Board member Klein. No. Board member Davis. Sorry. Are we voting to put a Cadence reading in eight? Uh-huh. And yeah. No. Board member Earl. No. Board member Hansen? No. Board member Hart? No. Board Chair Huntsman? No. Board member Hutchings? No. Board member Hymas? No. Board member Lear? No. Board member Moss? No. Board member Norton? Yes. <laughs> Board member Strait? No. Okay, that motion fails. Okay, it is 257. I'm going to try and get these two in if we can work quickly and efficiently. Hopefully we can. So board member Hansen. Yeah, I move that we move the transportation um, ask to number 11 and expand the list of uh, priorities to 11 to go to the legislature. It's actually going to the governor right now. Excuse me, to the governor. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, yeah. So the amendment is, is that the board moved the transportation funding request to number 11. And is that 5 million? Is that what it is? It is. Okay, thank you. Um, do I have a second to that amendment? I'll yes. second it. I have a second by board member Booth. I speak um, to that. Uh, yes, please. And just... Keep it brief if we can. I don't mean to be. Brief. I will be very brief, but I need to explain why something as unsexy as transportation should be on our list. Um, this is money that's already being spent by the schools, um, so they have to spend it. It's supposed to be funded under statute, but there's a provision that says it's as budget allows or something like that. If this is funded, it frees up not only the five million that goes to transportation, but then the the five million that the schools are already spending on transportation um, is freed up. So I think this makes the legislature or lets the legislature know we expect them to do what they've committed to do already. And then it's a double whammy for our schools. It's not a new program. This is freeing up general education funds for the schools to spend where they think it's important. So that's my rationale. Thank you. Um, I have a, a clarifying question. Dale, um, does transportation also re receive an increase in the WPU money? Uh, they, they would, and this $5 million would be on top of that. On top of that increase. Thank you. Okay, I was just looking for clarity. Okay, somebody else looking, uh, okay. Uh, Vice Chair Davis? 
I love it. I totally support this because I hate unfunded mandates, but I have my hand up for something else. Later. Thank you. Okay. Uh, board member Lear. I have my hand up for something else. Okay, well, I want you to know we're probably not going to get to all this something else because board member Hart and board member Scott Hansen have been up for uh, like 40 minutes. So, okay, so the motion right now on the table, the amendment on the table is, is that the board move the transportation funding request to item number 11. I don't see any new hands, so we'll start. Board member Booth. Yes. Board member Klein. Yes. Board member Davis. Yes. Board member Earl. Yes. Board member Hansen. Yes. Board member Hart. Yes. Uh, Chair Huntsman. Chair Huntsman. Yes. yes. Thank you. Board member Hutchings. Yes. Board member Hymas. Yes. Board member Lear. Yes. Board yes. member. Norton, I heard yes. you. I heard you. Uh, board member Strait. Yes. So that is unanimous. Okay, so we're moving that to number 11. So board member Hart, I think this will probably be our last yes, uh, one for today. Yeah. Uh, I move that we uh, remove uh, number of limit fees from the priority list. Okay, do I have a second to that, am to that am amendment? I'll second it. Second by board member Earl. Would you like to speak to that board member Hart? Yeah, I'm concerned that we don't have enough information on, on curricular fees yet. We, um, we get wildly different information each year. We just did um, some changes in, or clarifications to rule and, um, and trained people on it. I'm afraid that we don't have the correct number and if that number passes, and then we eight curricular fees, and then it doesn't turn out to be correct, uh, we're gonna pull uh, in the middle and up a creek. Thank I'm you, not against the idea, I'm against it and the content. Thank you, board member Hart. Board member uh, Lear, are you speaking to this? No, uh, no. Before you move on, can I get the motion? I apologize, but my I'm sorry, I did not hear the motion. Angie, the motion was to remove the um, number five, oh. eliminate curricular fees. Thank you, Angie. Um, board member Hansen, are you speaking to this? Yes, I just um, I'll speak in favor of this. I believe that we already have a fee waiver. Um, system in place so that as far as the equity goes, I think the kids who want access to whatever program they want to be in, if they fit the criteria, they can get those things waived. And I agree with board member Hart that we're, I'm, I'm not sure that we know exactly where we are on, on funding this. Okay. And uh, board member Hanson, I'm just going to get clarifying. This isn't for extracurricular. This is for curricular fees, such as books and beakers and things like that. Aren't those all waivable? Mm -hmm. They are. Vice Chair Belknap, I yes. apologize. I cannot raise my hand because I'm screen. It's fine. Go ahead. When I have a moment. May I speak to this? Yes, please. Just wanted to give some clarity and just a reminder that um, in statute, beginning with next year, the 22 23 school year, uh, LEAs will no longer be able to charge fees for textbooks. And that definition of textbook is fairly broad. So I wanted to just remind you of that um, coming. And then just this elimination of curricular fees was based on a data collection that our staff did this last year, um, and which was a requirement from a bill that Representative Robertson ran. You may remember that. We found there were $85 million of fees charged in the um, 2020-21 school year, 35 million of those were extracurricular and co-curricular, 50 million was the curricular fees. And I just thought that might be helpful information uh, of where we received that data. It came directly from our LEAs. Okay, Angie, follow up on that. So what you're saying is they cannot, no, they can no, our districts can no longer charge 
a curricular fee after the tw- starting the 23 school year? Um, not quite. They, they, they may no longer charge for instructional materials and curriculum. So curricular fees would be broader than that. An LEA may charge a fee, for example, for things other than instructional materials, but that is a large portion of curricular fees does include the instructional materials and textbooks. And beginning next year, the statute already has in place that LEAs may may not charge fees for instructional materials beginning with the next year. I believe that is part of the rationale that, um, for example, JLC prioritized it, but I don't, you know, I don't want to speak for them. Okay, thank you. Okay, just as a reminder, we are already five minutes over our allotted time, and I usually am one of those just that just stops right then. Um, we will finish through this process, but we won't take any more amendments at this time. Um, so I, I think I can do that. Chair Huntsman, do you have a comment here on this? On um, that? And it is, I think a lot of it was already stated, but the JLC, which is loaded with business administrators and everything else. There's another thing creeping up on it, and that is the consequences for noncompliance uh, to our school fees. That that is has got them really, really nervous <laughs> moving forward. And this is this in a way, um, basically having the legislature um, well, we're eliminating uh, curricular fees, but it's going to really lighten a a lot of the burden that our educators have from our teachers to our principals and et cetera that are in the curricular space of, of charging those fees. And these numbers, to my understanding, have been pretty well uh, vetted. I'm not sure if it's going to be perfect. So I'm, I'm speaking against having this eliminated. Thank, Thank you, you, Chair Huntsman. Um, Board Member Strait. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to say basically that I think the premise of the motion is incorrect. I think we do have that information and I think uh, we have a pretty good hand on it and I think uh, we need to move on it. We talk about unfunded mandates. Well, it could soon become that. Thank you. Um, Ara, if you're not gonna let me speak to my motion, can I speak to this? uh, uh, I definitely will let you speak to this board member, Lair. Okay. I. I think that the point is, if this does not remain on the list and is not funded, somehow LEAs are going to have to absorb $50 million of uh, costs, expenses that they have no, with which they have no money to pay. So it will result in inequity, inequity in that they'll eliminate programs, they will um, try to find workarounds. Um, in, in the effort to help kids. So I think it'll, I think it'll uh, absolutely hurt children. It was wrong-minded to begin with. And now as the cliff is approaching, we can see the, uh, the problem, the serious problem with removing this. And not, it's not just making them waivable. They'll be, they won't be able to charge them. Thank you, Board Member Lear. Um, uh, Board Member Earl. Just real quick, it's not the only option is not to work with the fees. It could be even changing the legislation itself. I mean, there's more options available. This the the idea that this is going to solve the problem. I'm not sure it does that. So I think there's more options out there. Thank you, Board Member Earl. Board Member Davis, Vice Chair Davis. Yeah, I know. I'm just struggling, and I don't know how to phrase that. It you know either change it the one way or fund it the other way. But for right now it is that these curricular fees are going away. That's what is in code. And we've already put massive hits, you know, minimum of 75 million was um, approximated for what we've already done with the extracurricular fees. And so now with the curriculars, it's gonna be another 50 million hit. I, I don't, I'm nervous to lose the 50 million ask and, I'm just I, I'm nervous to do that. Um, board member Hansen, you have your hand up. No, okay. Oh, already, I, I know. I already spoke. Sorry, I'll get it down. Thank you. I know Carol's keeping her up in hopes of all kinds of things to happen here. So, 
I'm, I'm just looking at what my processes and my options are, Miss Carol, just so you know. Um, hold on a minute. I got to just check. You're muted. Yeah, I knew I was I was just trying to get clarification of what we could do. So first of all, before we vote on this, I just need to to find out if there's any objection if we literally stop at 3:30 um, with anything that we're doing. It, does anyone have objection with carrying this for another? And actually, we're going to probably have to have another 10 minutes of discussion and then our final votes. It, does anyone have objection to that? I'm looking. I'm looking. You're, you're chairing the meeting. And so you, you, as long as you have your quorum, it's good to give them notice. Okay. So that's where we are. And at 320, we will start making our final votes here. Okay, just so everybody is aware of that. Okay, so um, Carol, do you have something to for this no. amendment that the board moves yes. number five from the priority list? No. Okay, thank you. I'll keep you on with your hand raised. Okay, so the, um, the amendment before the board right now is that the board remove number five from the priority list, which is to eliminate curricular fees. Um, we're going to go ahead and vote. Board member Booth? No. Board member Klein. Yes. Board member Davis. No. Board member Earl. Yes. Board member Hansen. No. Board member Hart. Yes. Board Vice uh, Chair Dave, Chair Huntsman. No. Uh, board member Hutchings. No. Board member Hymas? No. Board member Lear? No. Board member Moss? No. Board member Norton? No. Board member Strait? No. No. Okay, so I only see one more hand up, so that does not pass. So that will stay there. Uh, we will take one more amendment, which is now going to be from board member Lear. My motion is to divide the uh, discussion and the motion of um, number, and I have to see where it's gone to, number three, critical USB EFTEs, so that we can look at those individually and rather than as a, as a bundle. Oh, boy. If we can get that done in, in eight minutes, it'll be a miracle. Okay, so couldn't someone please pull up? Oh, do I have a second to that? Mo uh, um, that is your amendment, correct, Carol? Yes. yes. Okay, do I have a I'll second? Second. Uh, second by board member Booth. Um, can someone please pull those up? Okay, so and now, can I is this the best way? Would you like me to copy and paste those into the document, or is this? I think this is okay. Um, the one thing I did want to bring up that in in um, um, finance today they had a discussion on those three FTEs, and they are going to um, I don't know if absorb or move everybody into a monitoring status. I don't I don't know if that was voted on or not. So what do you mean by that? Um, I, I don't know if it got voted on in that committee or not, though. So I, I can't say that that's what came out. I was listening to it, but couldn't finish it. Sure, Belknap, I can speak to that. The, the money is still needed. It would just be moving from one part of the agency to financial operations. And it so wouldn't be necessarily under school fees project. It would be under monitors. Right, but the, the amounts are, are correct there. Those are still needed. Thank you. 
I can. Carol, go ahead. I, I can maybe make this simpler. I, I um, would like to eliminate that three FTEs for the school fees. I think I'm, I may need some help with this, but I um, uh, no, I, th I think we just need to vote on them all separately. Um, I'm sorry, that's the, that's the challenge. Um, because I think they're not they're not equally important. And so I think we need to vote on them separately. Can we vote? Could we vote with our thumbs, with our signal and, and see if that works on these? Um, we can try that. Um, Cindy, can you help me with that? But I'm just telling you, it'd be much easier if we can get this off the screen, then we can see you all at once. So if we know, if everyone knows we're going to vote on these individually, four FTEs, three FTEs, two FTEs, and one FTE, one FTE, and we say what they are. Carol, is, will that suffice what you're asking? That's, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so can we take this off the screen so we can see everybody, so we can just vote with a check mark? Thank you. That will be so helpful, um, I think. <laughs> All right, so if I can- explain. You'll have to call it out being the chair. Oh. Oh, I will. So the, the first one we're gonna vote on is the four FTEs for what, Angie, for? Educator licensing. For educator licensing. Okay, that is what we are voting on right now to either uh, to keep or not. I have a question by Chair, by Board Member Hansen. Excuse me. Before we vote, I'd like to hear from the maker of the motion uh, as to which FTEs um, she feels aren't necessary or which ones she feels are more important. Um, I'd like some background before we vote. And Thank my, you. My screen keeps going. Can you hear me? Yes. Because um, my screen's going away. I, 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 um, I don't support the... Uh, I don't support one of the licensing requirements because I think we've got we've got a UPAC uh, investigator blended in there, and I think that, that can be handled with the number of employees they currently have. Um, I want to uh, do away with or recharacterize the three the fees um, components or the three fees FTEs um, because I think that. We now have what that would be if it's characterized the same way. That's what 10 or 12 people um, working on the school fees compliance. It I don't know why school fees is so the the is so urgent in terms of um, um, bludgeoning, for lack of a better word, uh, LEAs with this that it requires that many people to bring about compliance. I'm all right with the other because I don't can't see them now, but I'm all right with the leadership one, and I'm all right with the what were the other two, Laura? Um, one is a library and one is a prevention specialist. And I'm all right with those three. I it just want to lose one UPAC um, person that's buried in the licensing group, and then I I want the fee people. Um, I I don't want any more compliance. Uh, monitors for school fees. The, the LEAs are done, and we should be treating this with assurances like we do every other and many other programs that require assurances and, and not doing the, the um, intensive work we're doing that isn't, for the most part, supportive of LEAs, but to them feels um, threatening, intimidating, and, um, and, and can't think of another good word. That's, so okay. that's what I want to do. I'm getting a couple of texts that that maybe the way you're understanding these aren't necessarily how they are in the business cases. However, I have been told if we want to divide this, then we have to have a motion to divide each one of these out. And I can just tell you, we're not going to make it. So, but but the this I, I part of my problem, Laura, is I don't think the business cases, and I'm not. I'm not suggesting nefarious motives on anybody's part, but I just feel like they are not um, fully uh, forthcoming in terms of, of the way that they're the way that these people will be used, and that's part of the problem. If you told me that those three 
feel if the if I was assured that those three C's people would only be providing assistance and resources and help, then I would feel better about it. But if they're going to be three more auditors, that's not what we need. But so I can't do that. We we need to we either have to move this or we have to have a question to divide chair huntsman can you help me here please um yeah it's we either divide this motion to divide and divide <laughs> it, or i just want to remind everyone too this is this is a starting place and it does go to the governor's office and based on result they take a look at this and they they might align some of their priorities with us but i assure you in this process based on results from the past this will be tweaked numerous. We, we're not even to first phase. We're, we'll have more than four opportunities, phase one, two, three, and then the home run, of course, home plate, to, to tweak this as a starting place um, and it's not our end game. But I understand how essential it is to try to start, start off um, as best you can, but you'd have to get a motion to divide. Yeah, and Vice Chair Davis. Um, you know, I, I'll wait and hear what um, Deputy Superintendent Jones has, but I have some thoughts that could make it a little faster. I, I think I'd rather hear from you. I think Scott's going to explain what's going to happen with each one of these. And I don't think we have time now to go over what is under the licensing people and what's under each piece. And we've already extended this past the time. And this is really hard for me to do. I start on time. I end on time. So Vice well, Chair Davis. If I, if I were going to do something, I would probably move to um, sort of rename and restructure those three FTEs that Carol's talking about. I don't know that I have a solution for the, um, the UPAC licensing situation, but. Um, what about. Yes. What if we moved that priority to the bottom of the list? So, Carol, are you making a new amendment? <laughs> well, to, in the interest of time, because we don't have time to adequately explain yes. the purpose of every single um, FTE on that list, which I think was a mistake in the beginning. It, it, it obscures a lot of information for board members. So, in in without the time to adequately explain those and decide if every one of those 15 people is necessary, I would move it to the bottom of the list. Okay, so the amendment to the amendment is to, and, and Angie or whoever's driving, can you bring that the sheet back up? So the amendment to the amendment is to um, not break these up, but to move uh, priority three. Uh, Three down to eleven. Eleven. No, I want to. I don't want to replace it with anything. I want to put it after everything on the list. Well, it would be eleven then. Okay. Point of order. Yes. It would not be an amendment to an amendment. It would yep. be an amendment because we're not going to vote to to divide. So then I am going to want to amend the amendment. <laughs> That's a my <laughs> Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. So do I have a second to this? I don't see one. <laughs> Vice Chair Davis. Uh, sure. I'll, I'll second it. I, no, I, I'm calling on you because your hands raised. I'll second it. I don't love moving the place, but I want to have the discussion open to amend. So, okay. But what I'm saying I'll is there wasn't it. a second. So you're now opening it. You're seconding it for discussion. If you'll call on me to make an amendment, I won't, I won't second it to move it. Well, your hand's already up. I'm going in the order of way hands are up. But if there's okay. no second, then she's next in line. Right, she's next in and line. Next. Okay. okay, so Vice Chair Davis, that's why I called on you. Vice Chair Davis. Okay, doc. Um, I move to um, rename the school fees FTEs to school monitors FTEs, and I'd like to speak to the motion. School monitor. 
fiscal monitor. Fiscal, mo fiscal monitor, sorry. Fiscal oh. monitor. All right. Uh, I'll second the second on the amendment. If if not, I'll second it. There, there's a second. Will you be quick, Vice Chair Davis? Yeah, I'll be quick. It's it's a it's a little tough, but I'll try to be. But um, this school fees team is moving into the financial ops section, and um, all of the other um, monitors there are called fiscal monitors. Um, but I also, to board member Lear's point earlier, um, there is some trepidation in in the way that people are perceiving the way that that things move forward here and. And I think that with our monitors, we're also, we need some flexibility. We're going to have onboarding of youth sims coming up. We've got a lot of programs. And I, I hope that our, um, we have an opportunity right now to take everything we've learned from our school fees. And it, our, we've had an awesome school fees team that's done a ton of training. We have learned a lot and take uh, the feedback that we have from our LEAs and how it's working and how it's implementing. And we need folks to sort of bridge that gap and figure out um, how to communicate and train and, um, uh, and do it in, in realistic ways. But, but I do wanna say this about our school fees team. Um, they have changed the way I looked at everything. And I know I'm taking a long time, Laura, but I do wanna say this. Every single thing I pay for for my kids now, I think about how would this, how would this impact me if I had no employment? How would this impact me if we had no money coming into our house? And I think that um, that is key. And what we have done is created that type of thought process for all of our LEAs at this point. So we don't ever wanna go back to where we were before the permanent injunction. And we want to keep that equity piece and we want to have some um, flexibility for our fiscal monitors as school fees needs ebb and flow, as USIMS fees ebb and flow, as all of these things ebb and flow. And um, I just, I think there's gonna be a little more flexibility for coaching and supporting as much as for monitoring. And um, that's my too long of speech. Thanks for letting me. Thank you. Okay, so the, the motion is before the, the amendment is that the board rename the school fees project FTEs within the USBE criti critical FTEs to fiscal monitors FTEs. Um, I don't see any discussion to that motion. I'm going to call for a vo voice call, so we'll see. So be ready to speak out. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? That worked better. Okay, so we are now back to our original motion, which is that, and, and Angie, I'm probably going to need you to move that up, um, that the this is the original motion now, or the amended motion, that the board adopts the following budget priorities and transmits to the governor these priorities priorities as shown in the budget tracker dated October 5th, 2021 as follows. Number one, WPU value increase. Number two, at-risk WPU add-on. Number three, critical USBE FTEs. Um, number uh, four, the BTS arts in all schools. Number five, eliminate curricular fees. Number six, USBE market adjustments. Um, number seven, center for continuous school improvement. Number eight, rural district economies of scale. Number nine, full day kindergarten. Number 10, special education, teacher shortage pilot. Number 11, transportation. Jenny, you have your hand up. Yes, a no vote means this. I don't really, I'm not ready for this to go to the governor. Is that accurate? That would be correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that clarifying. And I just read that motion. Um, I will be asking for a verbal again. All in favor of this amended motion, please vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. <laughs> No, I've got I've got two no votes, or do I have three? Three. Who's Call the out. other one? Who's who's the other no vote? Board member Earl, board member Klein, and Hart. Hart. And board member Hart. Thank you. 
All right, uh, Chair Huntsman. Okay. Um, I'll make them hold it. Can you hear me? Yes. You can't see me, so I don't dare turn it on. <laughs> yeah. Um, I make the motion that the board approves and direct staff to transmit to the governor for consideration all business cases listed on the budget tractor dated October 5th, 2021, and that the board direct staff to work with the legislators on potential amendments to Utah code as included in the policy request associated with these business cases. Do I have a second to that motion? Second. I've got a second by, by about a dozen people. I'll take board members straight on that one. Okay, and any discussion to that motion? Oh, thank you. Seeing none, okay, the motion before the board is that the board approves and directs staff to transmit to the governor for consideration all business cases listed on the budget <coughs> tracker dated October 5th, 2021, and that the board directs staff to work with legislators on potential amendments to Utah code as included in the policy re uh, requests associated with these business cases. We're gonna do a verbal vote again. All in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? No. 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 Okay. I've got I've got a no by board member Booth. No. I, no. I, I, yes. Okay. Who was the other no? The male no. Hymas. Uh, board member Hymas. Board member Earl. Board member Klein. Board member Hartz were no's. Do you have that, uh, Sybil? Yes, thank you. And I want to say bless all your hearts. It is 331. We've stayed so close all to right, that time. So, pass. Uh, yes, it passes. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that clarifying. Okay, have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you so much for your two days of hard work. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Chair. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.